Thank you. Thanks so much. Thank you. Good morning. Thank you, Alit, for that very kind introduction. Your, your job title is just fine. You're doing great. Uh, maybe I'll apply one day for, uh, to work for you, actually. Um, thank you. I'm really delighted to be here. First of all, it's amazing to see such a young set of faces in the crowd. This is just phenomenal. You're really the millennial generation, it looks like, that I like to talk about a lot, but don't get to spend a lot of time with. Uh, so this is a great opportunity. And I don't, do not think we could have aligned our presentations better, Waleed, because everything that I'm going to say is a direct follow-on and segue and builds on some of the data you've presented. So I'm very excited to dive in. And there's going to be time for questions. Please uh, get, your, get your brains uh, juiced up and, uh, and, and come up with something smart. Uh, and, uh, and I hope I'll do the same right now. So I'm, I'm always out there scouring for what is the sort of the, the big thing, right? But this time, uh, with this most recent book that I published last year called Connectography, it's about connectivity, right? And I've decided that connectivity is not only the biggest trend of the past and the present, but actually the future as well. The one word connectivity embodies so much, it pretty much sums up human behavior in the last 60,000 years. What if I were to ask you, 60,000 years ago when mankind began wandering out of Africa and populating the continents, what is it that we have collectively done over 60,000 years? Eight billion people spread across the planet. We can't agree on political philosophy or ideology. We don't all live in democratic societies. We don't all believe in capitalism. We don't all share the same religion, right? But in fact, every single human being 60,000 years of human history, what we've all been doing is exactly one thing, and that is building connectivity. Generations, centuries have come and gone. The only things that we've actually physically left behind are those, are those physical instruments, mechanisms of connectivity. It's the single most important thing that we as mankind do. It's the one thing that every human being wants and craves. We are much more interested in connecting to each other than we are in being tribal, communities that divide ourselves up into different kinds of nations and, 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 and communities and so forth. We actually seek connectivity. It is a deep human impulse. So I work with maps a lot. And the reason I do that is because it's as a revolt. It's a revolt against all of the maps that hang in your classrooms and even in your own offices. Because in your offices and in our children's classrooms around the world, we always have one kind of map, and it's a political map. And it shows you the 200 countries in the world, and it, it has a bias in it, right? It tells you inherently that we are divided from each other. We grow up from the age of four onwards, from the first time we look at a map till the day we die, the only maps we've ever seen are ones that show us that you're American, you're Canadian, you're Japanese, you're Chinese, you're German, you're Ethiopian, whatever the case may be, right? That's not the way human history actually works. All of those maps are wrong. This is the most accurate map you will ever see of the physical infrastructure of the world. We built this, right? It's not, that, it's not the inherited borders from the British Empire and the French Empire. This is the last 60 years of what us, our parents, our grandparents actually physically built because we wanted to, right? Not the stuff that we were left with because of World War I and World War II, the stuff that we're building to make the world useful, to make global society connected for today and for tomorrow. On this map, it's every single highway, railway, bridge, tunnel, airport, every oil and gas pipeline, electricity grid, and every internet cable across the ocean floor. If you add up all of this physical connectivity, all of this infrastructure, it's 150 times longer than all the political borders that divide us, right? Connectivity is the reality. That division is much smaller a story about the world than the physical connectivity that binds us all together. And if you were to do a time series of this, right, over the last uh, 60, 70 years since World War II, it would look like this skeleton that was spreading across the world, right? Wrapping the world, it's like, imagine the world spinning around and we're wrapping it in these multicolored balls of yarn, of infrastructure, of these highways and railways and internet cables. What do they do? They physically connect people, right? Because we don't get anywhere. You cannot do your business. CJ cannot get anywhere unless two human beings are getting connected to each other, two businesses, people in two geographies, and so forth. And the funny thing about this word connectivity is that today, growing up, especially all of you young people, to you it's a wireless thing, right? I'm connected, I've got my phone, right? You have no idea what a landline is, probably. Um, and yet, the funny thing is that connectivity, all connectivity, even the wireless kind, 
hinges on something physical. There's a physical underpinning, a physical foundation. And if you don't map it, you won't appreciate it, right? So that's why I make maps like this. They force you to appreciate connectivity. You will never grow your international business unless you're physically connected to that place. So even internet traffic and so forth, it's sure, you're, you're, you're on the receiving end of a wireless device, but without that internet cable, it's not gonna happen, right? So f it, it, connectivity is a deeply physical thing. It's something we have to appreciate, something we have to, we have to keep on investing in, and if we don't, we're not gonna grow our businesses the way we want to. And I'm very glad that Waleed used the, line, the phrase earlier, meeting latent demand, your exact words, right? Set me up perfectly, because what I, what, we, what I work on in the field of sort of global economics is applying this idea of supply and demand. Now, supply and demand is like microeconomics 101, right? Everyone knows what does supply and demand mean, right? Supply of vegetables is, is uh, low in the market, price is gonna go high, right? Supply and demand is how we set prices. Supply and demand, though, like connectivity, is something a lot deeper, a lot more fundamental, a lot more important. I think it's the single most important law in human history. Just like connectivity is the most important thing, the most important trend in the world, the most important law, the law that explains everything is the law of supply and demand. Because we're connecting to each other for a reason, right? We want to trade with each other, we want to learn from each other, we want to conquer each other. Whatever the case may be, over centuries of history, we don't get, we can't do it without connectivity. And the more we connect to each other, the more supply gets to meet demand globally, right? Timber from the Amazon, uh, food from, uh, from, um, from Australia or Russia, wine from France, the most basic resources, fuel from the Middle East, oil and gas, nothing gets anywhere without that infrastructure. The supply of things cannot meet the demand for things, right? Yourselves, the advertisers, the retailers, you can't sell whether people are physically coming to your store or whether you're uh, launching e-commerce campaigns and advertising around the world. Nothing happens. Supply cannot meet demand without that physical underpinning. So a fully connected world allows for the full flourishing of this most important law of history, supply and demand. And if you think about those, again, let's go back to Econ 101. You learned about supply and demand. You heard of names like Adam Smith, David Ricardo, uh, Emile Durkheim, these are some of my favorite economists and philosophers and sociologists. And in the 16th century, 17th century, 18th century, they already laid out these principles around what would happen, what would a, a free market look like? What would this, this uh, open, connected marketplace look like? In theory, it was theory at the time, the idea of the division of labor, where I'll do one part of the puzzle, you do the other part, I make one part of a product, you make the other part, right? That's the way the world's finally becoming in this century. It's taken a couple of hundred years for us to reach this full flourishing of this most important law. And you can see it in this map. Here's another map that you don't get to see every day. It shows you how the world's supply chains work. We tend to think every piece of clothing you wear has a label on it, and it says made in wherever, but it names you one place. Again, not true, not the way the world really works, not the way supply chains work. Let's look at an iPhone, laptop, pair of jeans, a pharmaceutical vaccine, a car. Where was it designed? Who's the person who drew the design? Where was the prototype developed? Maybe you know, using a 3D printer or some, some pieces of fiberglass or aluminum. Uh, then where was it manufactured? What about the steering wheel came from somewhere, the airbag came from somewhere? Where was it assembled? Then where was it sold and distributed? What about the uh, insurance for the car? What about the after sale servicing? What about when it's recycled and scrapped? In the life cycle of every single thing, of every single product you could conceivably buy, there is nothing anymore, absolutely nothing, that is not somehow global, not somehow international. You could be growing uh, a cabbage in your backyard, your seed, the seeds may have come from some other country, right? A lot of people talk to me about 3D printing. They say, hey, what about the 3D printing technology? I'm just gonna have this lovely device on my countertop and I'm gonna print you know, plastic toys for my kids. You'll even get to print organic matter. I'll print myself a, a, a Diet Coke or whatever the case may be. But all of that stuff had to come from somewhere. That 3D printer itself probably came from Korea, right? The components and the cartridges and the metals and the plastic right, came from all different places, it had to be assembled, and then it made it to your countertop. You cannot escape the globality. You cannot escape this 
radical supply and demand global connectivity. And that's just beginning now. Think about it. The world up until 25 years ago was still divided by the Cold War. You've had capitalist countries, communist countries. Everything I'm talking about, even when I'm referring to, again, ancient uh, or classical economists, is only starting to have happened in the last 25 years. We've only got 25 years of history in which we've actually making these things come to life. And I think that's what's so exciting about the world we live in today, because the connectivity has just begun. Right, the globalization has just begun. The internet, which all of us have now grown up with and take for granted, is only the newest layer of this connectivity. We couldn't have had the expansion of, of empires without the roads. You wouldn't have had the British Empire without the railways. Now this, this newest level, and global energy markets without pipelines, right, and, and liquid natural gas tankers that, that pull up to our ports here in California. The internet is now this newest layer. It's just the newest layer. We've always had, always thrived on physical connectivity, and the internet is just the newest layer, right? And obviously, it's very, very profound. How can someone be anti-globalization and think about globalization slowing down, globalization reversing? People, you hear about the anti-globalization movements. If you turn on the TV a few weeks ago, the G20 group of world leaders was gathering in Hamburg, and there were protesters. They had to be gunned down with water cannons. Uh, they were claiming to be against globalization. It's, it's actually just getting warmed up. This is just the tip of the iceberg, right? We've only had the internet. While the World Wide Web was actually launched in 1989, the same year that the Berlin Wall fell, right? So we're just getting started. And the fascinating thing about, the, about internet connectivity is that unlike the last three, four centuries, where our infrastructure, that stuff we need to connect to each other, right, is mostly funded by governments, the internet is different, right? Companies telecommunications companies, internet companies, ISPs, others, they are the ones who are driving this. And that's why it's working better. That's why it's going a lot faster, right, than any infrastructure in history, because already trillions of dollars have gone in to financing all of the internet cables and so forth that are connecting humanity to each other. So this, this map shows you, and Europe is at the center of this map, pretending you're looking at the world from the Arctic Circle view. Uh, Europeans have, uh, obviously, the large of any region in the world, the highest number of connected people, also with the fastest average broadband speeds. And the internet cables and the speed of those cables, you can see, is increasingly connecting every continent. Every month, you will read about Facebook co cooperating with Microsoft or Google cooperating with someone else to lay down an ever faster, um, you know, a many terabit per second uh, cable across the Pacific Ocean. Again, where would you guys be without those cables? Where would your business be without that connectivity? Nowhere, let's be honest, so appreciate the connectivity, the infrastructure that's being provided by the corporations of the world in cooperation with many governments. You want more connectivity. You want people to have faster speeds, right? Without, and that's a huge challenge. I'm gonna show you more and more data around how important this is because we're not gonna get anywhere in terms of your global expansion plans without that. And one of the most important things it does is to accelerate exactly the business you're in, right? Because I can make, you know, you can build faster ships that transport cars across the Indian Ocean. That's great, that's not exactly what you're, what you're into right now, right? This, this is the connectivity you need, this kind, because it accelerates the global digital services trade. The fastest growing space category, vertical, of global commerce is digital services, it is you. It is growing much faster. So again, there are a lot of people who are pessimistic about globalization. They say, hey, look at all those giant container ships that are parked off the coast of Singapore and Shanghai. Demand is down, goods aren't moving as much, right? Less consumption of uh, automobiles or less purchases of hair dryers in various countries and markets. That's a shrinking dimension of what globalization is. Nothing is growing faster than digital services trade, right? People exchanging information, buying and selling data, global e-commerce, and so forth. And it's not just trade, it's also investment, right? You can see how Amazon is going aggressively around the world, buying into different countries, into their e-commerce markets, increasing the SKUs that are available in those markets, and allowing for that seamless global shopping experience. And lots of other companies are getting in on that. Individual brands are realizing they need to build their own e-commerce capabilities domestically and internationally in order, to, uh, in order to access those global markets where people are getting 
connected. So the shift from just thinking about globalization and global trade from the physical to the digital is the single most important aspect of this new globalization. As I said, it's not just the trade in goods, but it's investment, right? Expanding your footprint through joint ventures, in particular abroad or partnerships as you're doing, is the way to get into those markets. And part of the reason is that we're all moving, getting, up, getting up to speed, getting smarter in the digital domain a lot faster, right? We obviously, a lot of innovations occur here in California, in Silicon Valley. Some of the greatest technologies and breakthroughs occur here in the United States, but that knowledge spreads very fast. And countries like uh, China, Japan, India, elsewhere, they wanna take that and they wanna own their market, right? They have a right to say, hey, wait a minute, um, if you wanna sell something in this country, you're gonna have to make it in this country. That's part of what India's industrial policy is all about right now. Prime Minister Modi of India, he puts a nice hashtag on it. It's called hashtag make in India, right? And, it's, and he tells aircraft manufacturers, um, vac uh, uh, pharmaceutical companies, anyone, even Tim Cook, Apple, flew to India last year, had a big summit, met everyone, had rose garlands wrapped around him, and, and he came and he said, I wanna open a flagship Apple store here in India. I wanna sell iPhones directly to your 1.4 billion citizens. And Prime Minister Modi said, no. You wanna sell an iPhone here? You gotta make it here. You gotta procure locally, right? So there's all sorts of barriers to the physical, uh, you know, free, free open movement of goods across borders today because countries wanna benefit as much as possible from that opportunity of the rapid spread of technology and they wanna employ their own people and, and have the technology in-house in their own countries. But when it comes to digital trade, you can move a lot faster, right? You can tie up these partnerships, you can circumvent barriers, digital barriers are a lot easier to move. So you are in the industry that has the advantage in this, in this world. So that's what I call the, that's really the global marketplace, if you will. And I'm delighted that there's such a large international audience today. Uh, whatever country you're from, your flag may not be on here, but I'll probably have a story about your country if you wanna ask. Um, but this is a very different kind of model. Now I put up this, this graphic because typically when we're talking about what does global power look like? Which centers of power matter? Who's number one, right? We're always looking for like a simple answer. Right? America, the 20th century, is it China in the 21st century? And please tell me just one or the other because that way it'll just be simple. Well, the world's not gonna be simple. It's not gonna be simple. It's gonna look like this. Right? And so here, here is your answer, here's your geopolitics 101. We've got our microeconomics 101 out of the way. Geopolitics 101, the 21st century diagram of who matters and where, and the answer is everyone. Right? It's not gonna be just America, just China, or America and China and no one else. Right? The way the world is starting to look is very regional. Right? Regions matter. If we were sitting in a corporate boardroom, Los Angeles, New York, in 1985 saying, what's our global market? What's our global strategy? You'd basically be saying, well, what's our strategy for Europe and Asia? And you would forget about Latin America and Africa, you know, wouldn't, you wouldn't even come up in the conversation. Middle East, forget about it, right? That's it. Well, today, it's very different, right? Today, every company that wants to be global actually has to be global. You have to cover every single market. You have to see the enormous potential of Latin America, of Africa, of the Middle East, of Asia, all at the same time. And what you have to appreciate most of all is that every region is connecting to every other region. So here you are as the platform, as the broker, as the connector between publishers and advertisers. You can do it from here anywhere, right? And everyone is trading with everyone else. The fastest growing, if you pick any of the circles here on this, on this map, and you look at the, the growth in trade and investment between them, take Asia and Africa, right? We're neither in Asia nor in Africa right now, but the trade between Asia and Africa but from 2002 to 2014, and so in other words, in the last decade, decade and a half, grew about 1,900%. Right? Global trade is growing on average at like 2%, 3%. I'm talking about 1,900% growth in trade between two continents, right, that haven't been very well connected to each other. So pick any pair of countries, pick any pair of regions in the world, especially the developing countries, the emerging markets, right, the places where you're starting to expand uh, by looking at Brazil and elsewhere. That's where all of this connectivity is starting to happen globally. So if you are sitting outside of these, these cross lines, these dyads of connectivity, you would be missing out 
on growth. So it's through your international partnerships, through your uh, uh, affiliations abroad that you can start to capture the new growth in these markets. So this is the permanently multi-regional, multi-civilizational structure of the world. We used to think, well, the world is dominated, if not by the US, then by Europe. It's certainly a Western world. But now East and West are both powerful, right? Asia and America, both powerful. Europe, very important. And really, you can see, if you look at the world, if you flatten out a map of the world, you would see that the Western Hemisphere is one third of the world economy. Europe and Africa and the Middle East is another third of the world economy. And Asia is a third of the world economy. These longitudinal zones, we all need each other because otherwise we're each really just getting a third, right? Well, then the eight, nine billion people in the world isn't really your market unless you're cutting across those zones. And I think that's very important. And here's might be, I think for you, the single most important map that I'll show you today, because this is the map of all eight or nine billion of us. Every single human being on Earth is a pixel on this map. Isn't it kind of weird that those maps I was talking about earlier in our classrooms and offices, there's no people on them, just, just borders, right? But that's not what your business is about, it's about people, right? So wouldn't it be nice to actually have a map that shows you where the people are, where are the customers, where's the business? So that's what this is about, right? So it not only is a heat map of the whole global population today, with yellow being the most dense, so you can see um, you know, just what the key, uh, you know, how, how we are so focused, as we always have, again, for 60,000 years, really millions of years, living near the coasts of the oceans, right? Living along major rivers. We need that to survive. We are a coastal civilization more than, here we are in California, very appropriate comment. We're a coastal civilization, coastal species, more than we are sort of a tribal one, right? That's, that's something that you see first and foremost here. The second thing is these ovals that I've made, these dashed ovals. Those are the 50 largest megacities in the world, right? Though that's where the action is. As you probably know, most of the world population now lives in cities, right? And that percentage is growing very, very rapidly. We're looking at now um, in a, a projection that by 2030, two thirds of the world population is gonna be living in cities. And there may be, again, 200 countries in the world, eight billion people, but what actually matters are those cities where people are the most connected, right? You can ignore entire swaths of the earth where people don't live, where countries are disconnected, where there isn't yet internet access, but what you've gotta get right you've got to get right, or at least these 50 cities. And the nice thing on this map is that even though the world is urbanizing rapidly, people are moving to cities, um, it takes a long time to become a mega city, like with you know, 25, 30, 40, 50 million people, like uh, Chongqing in China, or the Hong Kong to Guangzhou cluster in southern China, we call it the Pearl River Delta, it has about 60 million people in that dense area. Its economy is larger than all of India right now, right? So though, if you were an astronaut circling the Earth, you wouldn't be able to, you could see India, but you couldn't see Hong Kong, right? But that little speck has a larger economic value than the entire country of India right now, because those people are densely concentrated. They live in cities, and those cities are connected. They've got fast bandwidth internet access, education, right? So what you're looking for when you wanna figure out what are the global opportunities or what are the most important cities. Of course, here we are in one of them, the greater Los Angeles area, LA and New York, America's two largest cities. But out in Asia, the cities are actually three or four times larger, right? So, and e-commerce rates are growing very, very quickly. Consumerist culture, materialist culture are really taking off as people get to taste the benefits of capitalism and so forth for the first time in a generation, if, if ever, right? Wealth is expanding massively. The number of uh, billionaires in Russia, China, and India are, uh, they're the only, the, the, the sort of other three of the top four countries in the world with the largest number of billionaires besides America are Russia, uh, India, and China. So I recently moved to Singapore actually a couple of years ago, so just, over on the other side of the Pacific Ocean. There's a nonstop flight actually from here. Uh, it's a long one though. Uh, but that said, it's right down towards the bottom of this map. And it's only got five million people, but 75% of all the foreign investment that goes into all of Southeast Asia, which has 700 million people, so twice the population of North America, is filtered through one little city, 
right? Because it's a financial center. It's got very good regulations, good government, rule of law, um, you know, ve uh, very good, um, uh, obviously, broadband architecture. It's very connected around the region. So you want to be looking at a map like this. You want to be saying, hey, here are the 50 cities. Even if we come back in the year 2030, it's the same 50 cities. That's your market. That's where the customers are. That's where people are buying a lot, right? That's where you want to be. So this is useful. The larger circles show you just how important those cities are for the national economy. So if you, when you get out into the emerging markets and you go to Brazil and you look at uh, uh, Sao Paulo or you look at uh, Jakarta in Indonesia, the, the city can represent sometimes 40, 50 percent of the entire country's economy. A country might, like Brazil, may have 300 million people, Indonesia 200 million people, but just the city of Jakarta represents 70, 75 percent of the entire national economy, right? So you want to be thinking in terms of cities even more so than in terms of countries. And just how good is your data about the residents of those cities? Because they're the ones who are getting online very fast, signing up for lots of um, subscription-based services, e-commerce. Um, uh, all, all, all the, they're, they're increasingly conducting their lives online just the way we are here. So you can learn so much just by looking at a map, a demographic map like this. So one of the other things that was evident from that previous map is the importance of Asia. Most of the world population is already in Asia. Not only is most of the world population in cities, but most of it is in Asia. Now, what's interesting about this, and I just love this caption, right? A, a picture worth a thousand words, but basically one sentence sums it up very nicely, right? Uh, more people living in this circle than outside of it. And that's about one-sixth of the surface area of the world. But here's what's important for you to remember, especially since you're all so young. By the time you're 100 years old and you have children and grandchildren, this will still be true. This will still be true. This will never, ever change. You talk about fast-growing populations in Africa and the Middle East and youth bulges, right, and all this stuff. Doesn't matter. Add up the whole rest of the world. It will never, never add up to as many people as live just right there in Asia. The reason for that is not only because Asian populations are still growing, Right, even if they're slowing down a little bit in, uh, in China, for example, India is going to have more people than China in just 10 years from now. But the other reason is that the entire global population is starting to plateau. Now, most of you aren't old enough to remember, but Walid and I, we're, 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 we're old hands. We remember when in the 1990s, not quite the 1970s, 1990s, people were still saying, we're going to be in this Malthusian crisis of overpopulation. There's going to be you know, 15 billion people in the world. There won't be enough water. There won't be enough food. It's going to be a disaster, right? Uh, turns out we were wrong. The world population is probably never even going to reach 10 billion people, and we're already past about 8 or so billion. So most of the people who will ever live in the, in the world are already alive right now. And actually, in a, by around the year 2040, each of us will open up a newspaper. Well, probably it'll be a tablet or an I, you know, iPad <laughs> thing by then. But the headline, I assure you, will be, uh, world population peaks, begins to decline. We're all going to live to see that day when the world population actually begins to decline. So what does that mean? It's uh, good news, I suppose, when it comes to global food supply. We're not going to run out of food. We're going to figure out ways to feed everyone. That's good. Bad news for business, right? Because in human history, Growth comes from population growth, right? And also from, from infrastructure connectivity. But now that you can almost see the limit of the maximum number of people who are going to live in the world, everyone's fighting for that pie of customers, right? We can now see the full extent of the human capitalist pie, right? And it is going to be those 10 billion people, and everyone's going to want them. And it's going to be the people who are in those cities, and everyone's moving into those cities. So we have to squeeze a lot more productivity a lot more economic growth, a lot more value creation, right? a lot more consumption out of that world population. And that's, that's the space that you guys are in. And this is the space where that market is surging ahead the most quickly. And so let me get back to this point about, about globalization, because you see how we have been living through in the last couple of years. We had middle of 2016 Brexit end of 2016, election of Donald Trump, uh, this notion that there's this Western, uh, you know, European and American backlash against globalization, the sense of being left out. You don't see that in Asia, because if you look at the middle of the chart here, the Asian middle class has benefited the most from globalization in the last 25 years, right? I said the last 25 years have been the most extensive, rapid change 
in the entire history of the world, exactly these 25 years. And it's exactly in those 25 years that Asia has taken most advantage of being connected, right? China joined the World Trade Organization in 1999. It went from being a fairly backwards rural society to now being the world's largest economy. That's pretty fast, pretty fast moving, right? Pretty fast moving for a billion and a half people, don't you think? Um, so Asians as a whole, the five billion Asians, because remember, China is only uh, 1.4 billion people. There's 3.6 billion Asians who are not Chinese. But as a whole, their middle class is growing the fastest through global connectivity, global integration, global trade. But most of the middle class of the United States of America, middle class of Europe is over here on the right. Who has benefited the least in the last 25 years? Who has seen their wages grow the least from that connectivity? Because jobs may have been offshored, wages haven't grown as quickly, there's been a lot more competition from Asian uh, uh, banks and car manufacturers and dishwasher and appliance makers, right? It's become a true, total global marketplace. And those countries have practiced what I was showing you a couple of slides ago on the bottom, again, industrial policy, what I was saying about Prime Minister Modi, right? You want to sell it here, you got to make it here. They've been playing this game so well the last couple of decades, and this is the result. The result is that those countries or those people who feel like they're not winning from this global connectivity are lashing out against it, and those that are the winners are totally for it. When was the last time you saw an anti-globalization protest in India and China? You do surveys in those countries, 95% of people are like, Woohoo! global trade, right? Because, I mean, whether it's the parents or the children, they can remember when life was not nearly as good as it is now, right? So here, I don't want to say that we want to turn the tables, because right? this is a global audience here, right? You want to make sure that everyone wins. You want to make sure that the tide is lifting all boats, right? Because you wouldn't be making your international expansion plans if those Asians weren't winning, right? But we want to even things out. And how do you do that? Let's go back to rule number one, right? Single most powerful force in history, the reason why we are where we are today, the reason why the billions of Asians and Africans and Arabs are now on that strategy map, it's connectivity, right? Without connectivity, we don't get anywhere. Reason China, China is a superpower today is not because of nuclear weapons, right? It's because they opened their markets, they got connected. So we still have a long way to go in the digital connectivity that I've said is so important. This map, a cartogram really, it shows you not only, you get a sense obviously the large populations of Asia as I said earlier, but what's important in this one is the color coding because it shows you how much is left to go. Even in China and India, you don't have yet a very high percentage of internet users, right? In China they say there are 600 million active internet users. Again, population of China is more than twice that, right? India is gonna be larger than China in 10 years, even lower percentage of active internet users. Well, how are they gonna participate in e-commerce, global supply chains, right, digital marketing, without, without, without fast internet? That's why you see that Google and Facebook and others have launched huge initiatives with their own money to figure out how to fly bimps and blimps and balloons and planes and put mesh networks everywhere so that people can have free internet access. They're not going to reach them either without, without, that, without a faster and higher rate of connectivity, and neither are you, of course. So the point of this is to show that we have a very, very long way to go, in a good way, because it's an opportunity. You can, you can lament the inequality in the world, poverty in the world, or you can see it as an opportunity. Again, I mentioned I live in, in Singapore. It's the largest, it's the most wealthiest little country in Asia. The, the, if, if Asia were one country, the richest state or province would be Singapore and the poorest would be a place like Myanmar, right? Myanmar has just uh, emerged out of uh, isolation. Its per capita income is about $2,000 a year and Singapore's at $80,000 a year. That's a gap of 40 to one. I mean, we think we've got inequality. The richest state in America is Maryland, $60,000 a year per capita. The poorest is Mississippi, $30,000 a year. That's a gap of two to one, right? The gap in Asia between the richest and the poorest societies, 40 to one. But so is that a disaster? Is that a tragedy? I mean, billions of people are actually just working their way up the ladder slowly, slowly, or actually very, very quickly. But that gap of 40 to 1, is, that's, that's an opportunity. Because if you go to a place like Myanmar, first thing that happened when that country came out of uh, isolation is that Samsung 
It's the first thing, I mean, fine, Coca-Cola was in there too, of course, very quickly with a bottling plant. Next came Samsung, locked up a distribution deal. Go to Myanmar today. Beautiful country, I've been there a few times. Um, everyone's got their Samsung phones now. Telcos are choking each other, tripping over each other to get the telecom license, to get the bandwidth up from 2G to 3G to 4G, right? And that's 60 million people right there, right? And um, they obviously want to get connected. So now we finally have better and better data about what this internet connectivity, what this broadband connectivity, um, and mobile internet penetration most of all, because of course, as you very well know, mobile advertising is, is very much the uh, leading edge and the fastest growing sector of online advertising. What it does to, to GDP, because of course people can't spend if they don't have money, but the funny thing is, the interesting thing, the important thing, is that this connectivity is actually making people wealthier. It's not just that connectivity helps you reach them to sell to them, they're getting wealthier on the back of it because their economies are becoming services-based economies. They're leapfrogging into the sharing economy, right? Where suddenly you're online, you've got the app, it helps you find the job, you're getting paid via that app. So if you look at things like mobile banking, right? Mobile banking, microfinance is the heroic story of the past generation. People like uh, Mohammed, Mohammed Yusuf, Grameen Bank in Bangladesh. It took, it's taken decades for microfinance to spread around the world, for um, women in villages and others to get micro loans, to be able to buy maybe a household appliance or something like that, right? But in the shortest, in such a short period of time, mobile banking now reaches way more customers. And as you may know, one of the seminal sort of uh, examples of leadership in mobile banking is in Kenya, where they just said, you know what? We don't even trust our banking system. It's very corrupt, but now everyone's got a mobile phone. Let's just put the app in there. Boom, everyone's got their bank right here on their phone, right? So imagine that world. And that, of course, creates all these opportunities for mobile payments, um, which, which people are starting to engage in now as well, using their mobile phone credits, digital wallets, and so forth. All of these people who 10 years ago, five years ago, lived in military dictatorships, now are leapfrogging into that mobile e-commerce marketplace and don't even need cash. That's how fast things are changing. So you want to access those customers where they may be, especially in a place like Asia. And again, we have data now that tells us how that boosts GDP, right? You don't want these countries that are already so poor growing their per capita incomes at 1%, 2% a year. You need to see like big jumps, you know, 6%, 8%, 10% a year. And that's, what, that's what's going to allow these people to be real uh, customers, right, uh, online. And so this is fundamentally what making globalization work for everyone is about. The more people who are connected, the more opportunities they have to participate um, in global trade and global exchange, trading ideas, trading goods, services. And this is one of the areas that, that excites me the most because fundamentally, again, you're about reaching individuals. I'm interested in, in studying individuals, not just countries. And the ways in which connectivity helps every person participate in the global economy is really profound today. If you start with the, the big picture, look at the expansion of the World Trade Organization, which is now universal, almost every country is a member of it. Look at what, uh, again, for the physical movement of goods and services, what DHL, UPS, um, and other companies do. They help every country, they go, they go country, it's good for their business and it's good for yours. They help every country in the world figure out how to streamline their borders, right? So that goods can move more seamlessly. If we didn't have any more free trade agreements in the world, and after all, the Trump administration has just rejected one, the Trans-Pacific Partnership, estimates suggest, studies show that if you were to just reduce the friction at borders, right? Allow when a, when a plane, when a DHL plane lands in a, in a country, and if you were to make it faster for those goods to be offloaded and for the pilot's manifest to be checked off and the stuff to get through the border and get around, if you just reduce the friction at borders and didn't even have even more free trade, you would actually expand global GDP by 5%. Whereas all the free trade agreements in the world, they say, will only raise global GDP by about 1% or 2%. So reduce the friction, right? Get, make the world more seamless. And that's what technology is starting to do. That's what uh, companies are starting to do in their own interests. So you see banks starting to help countries harmonize their regulations. We've got the um, uh, things like what Alibaba is doing with its e-commerce marketplace. It started out as being a closed 
system inside of China. But now, of course, Alibaba is listed in New York. It's a three or four hundred billion dollar company. And now SMEs, right, small and medium enterprises, mom and pop companies, uh, people who make things on Etsy are getting on Alibaba and they're able to buy, sell, trade with people all over the world. And they're doing it within also the, the, uh, the sort of currency space, right? They're, they're, they're actually taking loans and credit within Alibaba without even having to go to a bank. So Jack Ma says that Alibaba is not a company. It's an economy, and that's exactly what it is. He's created a seamless economy for people all over the world to participate, buy, sell, trade in a borderless way. That's starting to happen as well. I see it happening with currency conversion. You know, it costs a lot of money. You pay wire transfer fees to send money abroad. There's new uh, technologies and platforms that allow you to more or less seamlessly move money uh, abroad. Um, I'm actually an advisor of a company in Silicon Valley called Globality. What Globality does is allow, again, an American company, an SME, you've got 10 employees um, and you do, let's say, architecture design or you know, legal uh, documentation. You can now market to companies all over the world on that platform and it provides all the common banking, escrow, financial, other services for both players. You don't have to open any international offices, right? Reduce the cost of globalization so that everyone can actually be part of it. And my favorite part of it is what individuals can do now, right? Because if you are a recent college graduate, you're sitting in a co-working space, you want to just do some online tests, you want to do some coding, you want to do some graphic design, right? You can go onto Upwork, uh, you can go onto any of these global platforms and quickly market yourself and be working for anyone anywhere in the world without ever having, ever having to, uh, to get on a plane, right? So the more connected people get, the more globalization winds up working for everyone. And then, of course, people need to make money off of that. This is the new career choice, or it's the de facto reality for so many people, is to work for themselves. The rate of uh, individual business registration more than uh, doubled, or even somewhere between doubled and tripled in the 10 years since the financial crisis, right? Very few people are lucky enough to work for CJ. Very few people are lucky enough to work for big, vertically integrated companies that provide a lifetime of employment and pensions and so forth. That's not the way the world works anymore, right? So uh, people today not only are working online, marketing themselves online, they need to figure out how to monetize their own data. And this is a very delicate space that you're obviously confronting and getting into uh, as you try and access, uh, you build your customers' profiles, your subscribers' pro profiles, um, is, is understanding more, to understand more about them. Well, we've been, everyone's been giving away their data for free. But now we're entering an era where people actually want to monetize that data about themselves, right? If you want access to where a person searches, where they buy, what they buy, people are finding ways, not necessarily to mask it, but are very much how to monetize it. So if you take uh, example, some of the examples I give here, Nielsen Ratings, uh, Swagbox, and others that are paying people to behave online, to use products online, to test that, or, or compensate them in some way, that's also how you uh, build loyalty, right? Find ways to get more individuals, get more businesses to participate in your data gathering and find ways to compensate them and that is going to build ever more sort of online communities. So people are looking to basically get or to, to get in on the, the profitability of this enormous asset class known as data, right? People say data is the new oil. The fascinating thing about, about well, oil is here or it's there, right? But data is different because data is, is everywhere, right? It's sort of in the ether. Multiple people can benefit from that data at the same time. And I think this is gonna be a very, very, very significant trend. In the same way that we see people who are able to become the, the YouTube stars and market themselves online and so forth, Facebook Live videos now allows you to take ad breaks, right? So every single company is finding ways to engage, to bring uh, their users into their uh, fold, into their network in a, in a trusted way. And you see a lot more of that international uh, connectivity taking place. This is just what, one metric of it is how many international friends do people have on uh, Facebook, right? And the percentages have in many cases doubled, in some cases tripled. So again, never left home, but now look, that peer-to-peer -peer marketplace of people sharing their ideas, their experiences, their favorite 
um, their, their favorite things to buy, and all of, their, all of those things are now being exchanged internationally a lot more than ever before, even if people never leave their, uh, their home. And this is the final point really comes down to, I wanted to bring it back to this generation, right, to the millennials, to all of you uh, here in this room, because I, I study very carefully the, the surveys, the research about the attitudes of people, in different age groups. I look at their political views. You know, are they, do they want to live in only a two-party country? No. Well, most American millennials want to see a third party or a fourth party, right? Uh, things like that. And one of the fascinating things, and we've, again, one of these unprecedented, never before in history, we had a time where we could so concretely, where the evidence is so overwhelming, that there is a generational worldview, right? Our parents or our grandparents, let's say your grandparents were from Germany or China or uh, you know, Finland or Saudi Arabia, they, you couldn't say, oh, well, you know, everyone who's in their 70s, they all kind of look at the world the same. Not true, right? The first time in history you can, you know, with, with very strong percentages, you can see how young people are saying they believe connectivity is a human right. Mobility is a human right. The ability to, the right to, to cross borders. They believe that environmental sustainability should be a number one priority for governments, right? All of these things, all of these virtuous ideas, this millennial generation seems to have in common around the world. And they're even answering this question, are you a global citizen? Do you feel like you're a global citizen? You wouldn't even ask that question of your grandparents' generation, right? Today, you've got people who live in countries, in fact, where most people will never leave that country Right? Think about Nigeria, China, India, right? Most Nigerians, Chinese, Indians, most Brazilians, Indonesians, most people in the largest countries in the world will never actually get on a plane and leave that country, right? There's a lot of them and they're not very rich. But they're the ones who in large percentage are saying, yes, there's something in my identity I feel is not just here where I am, but there's something global about it. And I want to be connected to other people. I want to share experiences with other people. I want to learn from other people. It is absolutely overwhelming, and that is going to be true, of course, even more so, I imagine, for all of, all of your children. So I think we have to not worry about as much about today's bad news, right? The anti-globalization movement, the anti-capitalism movement, the anti-technology movement. The problem is not that we, you don't want to stop capitalism, you don't want to stop globalization. What you actually want is you want more people to be part of it, right? So the way you overcome the opposition to globalization is by actually having more of it so that it's more evenly distributed, so that it's more fair. And that ultimately serves all of our purposes. It certainly serves yours because it brings about a world, of course, where the maximum number of people are able to participate in global digital marketplace and commerce. And so final image that I like to remind everyone that kind of brings it all together. We're, in, we're, a, we're a, an urban species, right? We are a coastal species. We are getting increasingly connected to each other. The future of the world is really not just 200 neatly divided countries on a map. It's actually hundreds of cities with a billions of people that are striving first and foremost. Again, the ultimate human impulse is connectivity. And that's not just people, it's cities to get connected more and more to each other. And that creates this global network civilization that only really began to take off in the last two decades and is absolutely, I guarantee, going to accelerate in the coming decades. And that's why I think for all of you, the marketplace is digital, the marketplace is global, and you are really the right, right people, the right place at the right time. So I wish you much success. I want to thank you for allowing me to be here today and look forward to taking your questions. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And I think there are going to be some microphones, so don't be shy. Over in the back. Uh, in the front. Wait, wait for the microphone. <laughs> How did you get into uh, the global interconnectivity, how did you find your way to this business? Oh, uh, that's a great question. Um, so I uh, travel is the one answer. It's sort of like I travel, therefore I am, is kind of my answer to this. I, I, I grew up just traveling. I, mean, I was born in India, I grew up in the Middle East, in New York, and in Germany. Um, and uh, in fact, so but when I was uh, 12, the Berlin Wall fell, 1989. And I was in the eighth grade and uh, in New York, and my parents pulled me and my brother out of school 
and said, we're going to go check this out. And we flew to Berlin, and literally most of the Berlin Wall still stood because you didn't actually knock down 150 kilometers of wall overnight. It was all still there except for a couple of little slabs, right? So for months, actually for years after that, uh, people actually took hammers and chisels and went and knocked down, you know, took apart this wall. And I was there in the first, like, couple of weeks. Uh, so I went and actually I brought, like I took Ziploc bags and I filled them with pieces of the Berlin Wall and I took them all back to my eighth grade. So I was kind of hooked on, you know, I was kind of a globalization junkie from the time I was 12. <laughs> Over there. Hey, Parag, uh, this is Jay Das from Wells Fargo Bank. Uh, so I enjoyed your talk. Thanks. Thank you for bringing the topic in front of us. But I heard one thing, both from Walid's and your um, pieces, the globalization, the global commerce, and all of that. Um, as, as an economist, uh, obviously, you can think of all the currency uh, problems that the global commerce might be bring, right? Dollar is accepted, but not everywhere as an official uh, currency. So what's your thought about that? How the society is there thinking about it? What's your thought to bring those uh, problems into one single currency thing? And we see in the EU, it, they are going at least towards the uh, reverse order, right? So I'm thinking, is the Bitcoin of the world, uh, any, any thoughts around there? How, how could we bring a currency that could mobilize all of that global commerce? That's a, that's a great question. So believe it or not, the, the, the world's major currencies have been converging quite nicely. If this were the 1970s, 1980s, uh, and let's say you were a currency trader or a speculator, or even a backpacker, let's say you were just graduated high school and you wanted to backpack around Europe, as, as so many people do or did, um, when you guys did your euro railing, right, you, you've grown up with the euro, you only need one currency. Actually, when I was doing it, I had Ziploc bags again. I had my Italian lira, I had my Spanish pesos, I had my Swiss francs, my German Deutschmarks, right? All these different Ziplocs of currencies. That was that world. Today, actually, you have not only in the Eurozone one currency, but even the exchange rates have converged pretty nicely. The volatility we've seen in the last couple of months, like, oh my God, you know, the Euro is up by 10%, right? Or the RMB has gone down 10%. 10% is nothing. We used to see volatility of hundreds of percent like within hours, right, in certain weak, you know, emerging market currencies. So we're actually starting to bring things closer and closer. The world only has four important currencies left, right? The dollar, the yen, the euro, um, and, uh, what, dollar, and, the, and of course the Chinese RMB, right? Just four important currencies in the world. And because they, those four economies happen to be the most integrated with each other, they, and buying and selling to each other, they have to keep their currencies relatively close because that's billions of dollars a day, billions per day that get lost if people in one market can no longer afford the stuff in the other market. Then you've got Bitcoins of the world. Now, I think that's still extremely important. Now, everyone's going to, let's not get too hung up on Bitcoin because Bitcoin is one cryptocurrency, right? The more important thing is cryptocurrency or just digital coins. The largest banks in the whole world from all different countries have just in the last couple of months decided to use their own common digital currency on the blockchain to quickly, rapidly be able to transfer volumes of cash that they buy and sell to each other. Most lending between banks, right? Most cross-border financial flows is just banks lending money to each other. They're going to do it through their own digital currency now. Then we've got our Bitcoins and our other kinds of, kinds of coins that are, that are out there. I think all of them have a lot of potential and one's not going to replace the other. What we'll see instead is this kind of patchwork where for different purposes, people will use different currencies. So within Facebook, you'll have your Facebook wallet of credits. You know, some, it may be linked to a currency or it may just be Facebook credits. Um, there are entire physical places in the world. Uh, in, in Tel Aviv in Israel, they're working on this new kind of urban enclave where they're gonna use uh, you know, the, this, this, this digital currency linked to the services you provide. So you're a taxi driver, you charge X coins you know, for a service, you're a teacher, you get paid in, in X amount of coins, you're a cleaning person, you get paid X amount. It's all gonna be based on that currency in almost a barter-like kind of way. So I'm, I'm for all of it, but it's important to remember that no one of these is ever gonna win out against the others, and that, that's totally fine. Because the more important thing is that people get empowered 
to participate, right? to consume, to spend, to transact. And that's going to be done in whatever way is closest to them. So it doesn't have to be a US dollar in Africa. It can be a, a Bitcoin in Africa or something like that. And so wherever people are, they'll get, they'll get a hold of those things. Or they'll have their own wallet, again, a digital wallet, which they have a mix of real currencies and digital currencies. Totally fine. It's a reminder, of course, to, to everyone in, in, in the space that you're in that you want to think about how are you going to price your services um, you know, and, and in what currency you may be selling to customers in the future. Because it could be uh, more than one, even within the same country. That future is absolutely there already. Maybe last one? Okay. Hey, hey Parag. Um, you mentioned that you live in Singapore currently. And I was just wondering what you think about, what is it about Singapore that makes it such a great place for global commerce? Sure. So, I mean, it's a, it's a long story and a short story. I guess I'll give you the short story. Uh, um, but, you know, starting in the 1950s, when, uh, in 1960s, when it became an independent country, Singapore is only 52 years old as a country. Um, they immediately invested in infrastructure, right, building world-class infrastructure, the best airport in the world, and best schools, and, you know, you know, nice skyscrapers, everything shiny and new, and always keeping it up, and attracting multinational companies, educating workers, so people are educated at an absurdly high level. You've probably heard of Singapore math. You know, it's like a hot thing in high schools in America now. So they did all that basic hardware and software kind of stuff. Uh, then they said, look, we can't survive on our own. We import all our food. We import all our fuel. We even import all our water. Um, we've got to be connected. So it's now the single most trade-dependent country in the world, right? So without openness, without connectivity, the place, I mean, literally everyone there would die, right? So they just fully embrace connectivity. They support every possible uh, trade you know, liberalization uh, maneuver or agreement. In fact, there's a famous uh, former trade minister. He said, we would sign, a Singaporean, he said, we would sign a free trade agreement with the moon if we could. Uh, it's literally, it's just like punchline because that's their attitude. So this constant radical embrace of connectivity. And what, what happens when you, when, you fun, when you just get used to that and you have no choice? You have to learn to compete, right? Because they can't compete on price and electronics anymore. They get paid too much. It's all being done in Thailand. So they've got to teach their people the next, next thing, and then maintain unemployment levels at basically zero, because there is basically zero unemployment in, in that country. Um, so being connected forces you to always, always innovate. It forces you to compete and to innovate. So this, this sort of, you know, be brave and embrace uh, 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 change and innovate, that only comes from the force of being connected and just appreciating that you will never not be connected. So that's the, the short answer to where they got to where they are. All right, I'm out of time. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lovie. Thank you. You're awesome.